So first of all, then, Mark, uh, thanks for jumping on the call with me today. Um, can you start by just telling me a little bit about yourself and um, sort of how you first got involved with rugby, how you fell in love with the game? Yeah, I played rugby since I was about five years of age in my hometown called Barry. Um, played all the way through youth rugby, uh, through the age grades, went to university and then got injured, injured my lower back um, and then just realised how much love I had for the game and it's what I wanted to do. Um, so I got one of my friends was a analyst for the Cardiff Blues. Um, he's also my landlord. Um, so we got talking and he said, do you want to come in, come in for a day and just see what we do with the coaches? So that was 14 years ago and I went in for a day and then I never left. So um, that's pretty much in a nutshell. Uh, and I worked in North Wales for a couple of years with a new professional team there, which was awesome. Did two, year, two and a bit years there, um, which allowed me to kind of learn what analysis is and working with the coaches and, to be honest, technology, I wasn't amazing in it. Um, so I really had to grow, grow my knowledge on that. And I got a job with the Scarlets, with their academy, um, which is a team I supported when I was younger. So that was awesome. And after a couple of years, then I got promoted to a senior role there, which was cool. Um, a little bit more pressure. Travelled with a team all around Europe. Um, so I was there for six years. And then I got a job um, with the Welsh setup mainly doing um, the Wales 20s, heading up all that stuff. So traveling the world again, which is just amazing. Um, but also seeing the growth of all the academy players, which is something I'm still passionate about. Um, then I turned 30, felt like a midlife crisis, but I was only 30. Um, and I just decided that it was, I loved my job and like work, my last game was working with Wales against South Africa. It was like 86,000. And I was like, I just need to see the world. So I told my boss, who was head of rugby then, Garant John, um, he wasn't happy, but he was. And he was like, OK, I'll help you out. So he got me a job in Hong Kong. Um, There's loads of Welsh people there somehow. So I worked with Hong Kong rugby for three years. Got to travel that part of the world and just really grow as a person as well. Um, and some leadership skills because I had to run and be manager of a few analysts. Um, but then I come to a crossroads. My girlfriend's American, uh, which I've met a few years before. So uh, I always loved America and American sport uh, growing up, like I think everyone in the world does. Yeah. Um, and then I saw the MLR was growing. Um, and I thought it was actually a great time to get involved in a country or North America, including Canada, where the future is going to be bright for them. So um, I reached out through my connections and I got a job here with LA um, and I work with Rugby Canada as well, uh, part time helping them with Kingsley Jones. Um, and yeah, that's been my journey. And we, I got here last January, um, middle of COVID. We had a camp in Hawaii for six weeks. We We all just got on a plane and met each other, which was just actually a bit surreal and then we did four weeks of training and then we won can't remember 13 out of 16 games or whatever and ended up winning the final so it was a bit of a whirlwind of last couple of years but yeah that was my journey to here yeah and obviously you mentioned your time in Hong Kong and I know you traveled a lot when you were based in Hong Kong is that something you've really enjoyed doing experience in a load of different um, environments and sort of cultures yeah, I think I think in work from a work base, I feel like I've really grown as a person, like understanding cultures. Like we currently have 16 different nationalities and cultures here at the Giltinis. We've only got 35 players. So like when you think of that, Islanders, you know, different, but we've got Aboriginal boys here, two Aboriginal boys, like white people, you know what I mean? All all different races yeah. and everything background so um i don't think i'd be able to deal with it as well as i do here without those experiences in hong kong because the asian community and the asian way of doing things is so different to anywhere else so i think work-wise i've seen huge growth in, in myself but just in general different like you say different cultures i traveled all around asia sometimes on my own 
so my work life balance or the, my development in work and life i think has gone hand in hand because i've thrown myself into those situations and it's definitely something everyone i speak to who's young and i work with believe it's a really really good growth for you uh, professionally and also outside of the workplace for sure yeah and for those that maybe don't understand your role um like fully can you explain sort of um your job as a performance analysis and how important that role is to the team yeah it's grown significantly from when i started before it was mainly just kind of like a cameraman like that that would be the perception um which was my perception uh, but from 14 years ago to now just the detail of you're pretty much the eyes and the ears for the coaches, for the players. Um, I break down everything from our training, our quality in training, to the referee for the next weekend, his traits, his personalities, how we can potentially manipulate him, how we have to abide by some of his traits, um, how we play, our game plan stuff, individual game plan stuff, individual motivational movies for players that might need it um so and then when we play the game in game stats in game clips for the tv in the changing room um you're just kind of the information board um for the whole team always but that's really evolved in the last 10 years through drones technology for instant feedback so it's really it's a lot harder now because <laughs> yeah. it's just so much, so much on offer and all the coaches cut their own clips. There's five, six camera angles of every game. We have stats coming out of our ears. We have GPS. So when I first started, it was more put the game up on the screen and we watch it as a group. Yeah. Now we've got every stat under the sun, every angle under the sun. So my role now especially here is really making sure we filter all our information into a good package for maximal learning. Um, and that takes a lot of time. Um, but again, I something I'm bit, I think I'm quite confident with it now because, because of my journey of working with academies at the Scarlet, working with high pressure environment like Wales, working with Hong Kong, different cultures, different levels of coaches, it's been perfect transition for me here because I have a really big role within the coaching group. Um, so as an analyst, that would be the basics, but then really filtering the information, supporting the coaches with their feedback is a big part of my role here, which might be a bit different to another analyst or another club back in the UK. Um, I have a lot of a lot of my time is spent with the coaches making sure we're filtering the right information. Yeah. And then obviously most recently you moved to LA and I just wanted to ask sort of how that came about and what's life like in LA? It's pretty terrible. Yeah. <laughs> no, nah, nah, it's, um, it's a little bit different to Wales where it rains every day. Um, I feel really, really, it's like a bit of a dream, but it's something I've always, I've traveled to the US all my life. Every off season, I'd come to California and spend a few weeks relaxing. So if five years ago, you told me I'd be working for an awesome rugby team with a real good group of people living on the beach in, in LA. Like, I, obviously I would say you're having a laugh, but um, it, it really, I, I would say it has a huge impact on our club. Like I said, 16 different cultures, national, nationalities, including staff. And we live on the beach. We train two minutes. For, the boys are just down the beach now doing recovery. It, it really does have an impact on the happiness of the group and just the attraction of the club as well. Um, I think, I don't think you can find a, a better location for a rugby team in the world, to be honest, like, the boys ride the electric scooter. They all live in apartments on the beach. They ride electric scooters to work six, seven minutes. They train and they go down the beach and go surfing in the afternoon. So we're very, very lucky. Um, and I'm sure 
from Matt Gitto down to our academy players I was just talking to now. It's a really, really fortunate environment to be in because I know when I used to drive down to West Wales in an hour and a half traffic, uh, traffic in the rain when it was dark and then leave when it was dark. The environment was good, but it's, yeah. it's a little bit tougher. So, yeah, we're very, we're very we're very aware how lucky we are to be here for sure. Yeah, and you mentioned how, how good it is for the players to be um, in, a, in a city like LA, but how has the city reacted to having a, their first professional rugby team in, in the city? Um, it's, a, it's a huge place, LA. Um, very densely populated, but it's also very big and everyone drives. So la- last year... Um, we had we had about four or five thousand to every game at the Coliseum, which is a historic stadium, which is and again is incredible. But we had a good atmosphere, if I'm honest with you. This year we've had considerably less fans, and we don't know why because we won the league. I think maybe a little bit of novelty of rug, you know, everyone got behind us last year and we won. Um, I don't really know what the drop off is. Um, but we've definitely seen growth of supporters on our social media pages, like kind of people sending messages to the boys. Um, it's a very, very competitive market in LA, though. I think there's eight or nine professional sports teams. And you look at, obviously, you look at like the Chargers, the Lakers, like we're up against it, but we've definitely seen huge growth. Um, a couple of examples for you is obviously our kit is pink and Giltinis, but when we go to airports and stuff, we get a lot more attention than we used to. And like you hear people shout and go Giltinis and like, whereas last year people didn't really know us. So I definitely see there's growth, but we've got a long way to go. Um, we've got a long way to go yet, but yeah, we've definitely seen growth there. Yeah, you mentioned the um, the other professional sports teams in in LA and well across America, just how huge um, the sporting sphere is in America. As a performance analysis, do you ever look into sort of other sports and take inspiration from them for sort of how you can get the best out of the boys in rugby? Um, I ha- I haven't since I've been here, um, but I have previously um, because I know rugby. Rugby was kind of leading the way in performance analysis, especially Wales, maybe a decade ago. But I've definitely seen a lot more growth across sports now. Um, just using analysts, using performance analysis a lot more, especially in football, as in soccer. Um, I know a few boys I went to uni with um, are analysts there, and they kind of cover as much as we do with the amount of detail. Um, so I, I haven't delved in too much detail especially last year because it was covid and it's impossible it is very difficult to go into the la lakers and speak to their coaches and their analysts even though we're only five minutes away um but i've definitely been on zooms and conferences and i went to vegas at christmas time it was called a human performance uh conference it was at the ufc center in vegas and that was one of the best conferences I've ever been to. It was incredible. We were listening to um, the head of performance for the UFC, who was, I forgot his name now, an English guy. Um, yeah. But he was just talking about how, how they monitor the athletes, how they analyze the athletes. It's on about different cultures. Um, that was one of the best. And obviously, if I was in Wales, I wouldn't have had that opportunity to network with those people. So I haven't done as much as potentially you think I would um but that UFC one was good I kind of like going outside the box so I don't really want to go into like a a soccer one or like an NFL like the UFC was awesome because they're individual athletes but they're different cultures different drivers it was it was really really good um so I hope that answers your question yeah and obviously Quite quite good time in for this call, but recently being announced the 2031 and 2033 World Cups will be held in America. So uh, what can rugby fans expect from, from everything, from the facilities, the stadiums, um, right to the hospitality as well? Yeah, I think 
like I said at the start of the interview, I've always loved American sport and like I've been to Lakers games. Um, some of the boys went to the Super Bowl. I've been to a couple of football games, college football games. If there's one thing Americans do better than anyone in the world is put on a show. Stadiums are incredible. The facilities are incredible. Like, yeah, it'll, it'll be one of the best. I went to the World Cup in 2019 in Japan. It was really good. Um, but I put my life on it. The, the USA will deliver an incredible spectacle. I'd say the stadiums are sensational. Like SoFi Stadium here is $5 billion. And we played a game in there last year against Utah. And seeing something like that full with like Wales, New Zealand, let's say, or USA, New Zealand, they'll, yeah, you, I think I think the show won't outperform the rugby, but people will definitely have a good time, um, for sure. And moving back to the Giltinis, and you mentioned some of the boys earlier, and I, I don't think it'll be an interview with someone from the from the Giltinis without touching on uh, Matt Ghetto or Adam Ashley Cooper. But what are they like to work with and sort of what do they bring to the group, not just um, rugby playing ability, but just um, just being able to talk to them and uh, some of the younger boys to learn off and stuff like that? Um, yeah, that's, that's probably the biggest thing for me is because we were a close group last year and we're only a small squad and we all moved to, our, uh, to the US. Like, I couldn't believe how just nice they were they're just genuinely they're absolute competitors which i uh, they're the, some of the best in the business they're for their ages and the way they, they held themselves was incredible they they compete in everything that they can do team meetings basketball after training on the field just their focus and their ability to perform every single day was incredible, but just the people they are, like especially Matt Gato and, and Adam Ashley Cooper, like they were so good with the young boys. They were like really honest. They drove the group um, and just really, really good people. Um, it was uh, honestly, in all my experience, even in Wales and stuff, they were unbelievable. And there's, there's just no coincidence. They are who they are, you know? Um, yeah very huge social media can give you a perception you know like they're the rock stars they're the nicest people the hardest working last people on the field probably hear the cliche but incredible uh, and the influence they had on the young american boys was incredible as well git was out every day helping the boys kick and you know like these guys boys playing with them are in awe of them yeah but they 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 their their professionalism and their drive they didn't really have to say anything to anyone else because you're either with them or you're not and you're obviously going to be with them aren't you so um they were they were unbelievable mate and i can't speak highly enough about especially those two um really really good learnings from those guys and obviously, they're really important, aren't they? Um, players like that and players like Ma and Nonu um, for building the MLR brand mm-hmm. and, and the brand of the individual clubs as well. Yeah, and I think we'll see, like, Milner Scudder and Wasaki Naholo just signed for New York and Ro- Chris Robshaw. And like, I think, obviously, exciting time to be here, like you said, in... Nine, ten years, Rugby World Cups come to the USA. This year's MLR has been really competitive. Like you've got certain, like New England Free Jacks. They don't have rock stars in the team, but they've got some really, really good players and they play some good rugby. Every, every team's beaten everyone. Um, they've also got the Rugby Network, which is a free app which anyone around the world can watch the game. So they're really invested in heavily into the sport and growing it so for me especially after the rugby world cup next year i think mlr 2024 could be a bit of a rock star league where 
yeah, <laughs> depends on what the salary caps are, but <laughs> I think you, I think we could see some really exciting developments over the next couple of years for sure. Yeah, you mentioned the rugby network. It's brilliant. Um, it's obviously very different from from uh, the Premiership and and the Pro uh, Sixteen or whatever, with just the money involved. Completely different leagues, but the coverage of the rugby network is brilliant, isn't it? And I think a lot of um, a lot of other leagues could sort of take a, a leaf out of their book with just the content that they provide. Yeah, and I think they try and do it their own way, you know, like quite quirky and the commentators like say some stuff which just make me laugh. But I think it's great they're trying to do their doing their own thing and trying to be different. Um, and especially with the restraints of the budget, you know, like they don't have the Sky Sports money and stuff, but I think they do a really, really good job of spreading spreading the word that USA rugby and North American rugby's kind of growing and it, seeing them get the Rugby World Cup's incredible and it's exciting for me as well um, to be a part of it. And you mentioned it earlier as well, obviously, the Giltinis won their inaugural um, uh, MLR championship. What was that like? What did you make of the season as a, as a whole and what was that like to be a part of? It's pretty surreal. Like we on Zooms, taking the mick out of each other, doing performances, getting to know each other as a group. Um, our coach last year really installed a good culture. Um, very professional, but also the importance of uh, connecting as, as people was huge for him. And I've never been in, involved in an environment where it doesn't matter if you're Matt Gitto or you're an academy player, we're all pretty equal. Um, and like, it was just a group of guys um, just having a good time working hard. And it is really cliche because you always hear it, but we just did some awesome stuff. Like we all shared, our coach made everyone share their story. Um, so it didn't matter if you're the kit man or you were Adam Ashley Cooper or the head coach, we all sat around and shared our stories um, from childhood to how we got here, kind of like I started with you. Um, and it was really cool. And I think we kind of underestimated the importance of that. Um, and we just really become close as a group. And then the icing on the cake, obviously, we were just carving teams up. So when 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 you win, it's obviously easy. But I just think the last couple of weeks, the the laser focus in training was it was amazing, led by Matt Gitto, Adam Ashley Cooper, Dave Dano, our captain. Like they just took crap. Like the coaches kind of just sat back, really. Yeah. And like the, the boys just led it. And then that final week, it was just is one of the best it's probably the best six months of my life my professional life because we all jumped into the unknown during a time when no one knew what the hell was going on with the world and we stuck together for six months and we did something i believe only one other team in history has ever done across any sport professional sport which is winning the your inaugural season and we said that once we won it and like our coach was like, whatever happens in your life, you're a part of history. Um, so it was amazing. Um, and it makes me like tingle now because I know, I know it's not the World Cup and I know it's not Pro 16 or wherever like that, but people saw how special that moment was for everyone. And after like our head coach had all the families, all the kids, all the brothers and sisters all in the change room after and we're in there for hours just singing and dancing and I've just never seen it before <laughs> you know what I mean like yeah you don't see that in Heineken Cup you don't like the head coach was like no your wives have sacrificed your kids have sacrificed we're all in it together and it was really powerful yeah um, I think was it the final there was um like I remember seeing obviously all the families and stuff on the pitch and you had like a, yeah. a band or a singer or something playing and just all the families. St Steve, Ioki, Steve Ioki, yeah. Oh, it was, yeah, it was Steve <laughs> Ioki. Yeah, and, but you just had everyone like on the pitch just um, just enjoying the moment. It was it was definitely different to, to sort of 
stuff that you'd normally see. And, of- and we and we we don't promote it enough, I don't think. Um, but it's really powerful, you know, like everyone knows each other's kids. Like from my experience working in rugby for so long, I just haven't seen such a kids. I know this is off topic, but kids like run up to other players and give them a hug and because yeah. they're so close and they've only just met a year ago. So like the power within that is incredible. Yeah. Uh, obviously you've got to get the skills right on the field, but talking about playing for each other and stuff is really, really powerful. Do, do you think that like some environments are just so focused on the sort of professional um, aspect that they forget like the personal aspect as well? And then obviously hundred percent what you've like what you've mentioned with the with the guillotinis and like it's sort of um the only other place I can think of that they sort of come out with the same sort of stuff is like a Bristol. Um Pat Lamb is supposedly very uh, focused on like personal relationships and stuff as well. And then that normally you can see how much that I think people players pl- perform better when they're in a better headspace. Yeah. Um I I think it comes with age and just experiences, you know, like Pat Lamb's been around for so long and he's found his niche in getting the best out of the players. And for some players that might be they're unfit. So you've got to grind them like a drill sergeant and other players just might need to be happy with their families, you know? So I'm learning that the older I get and I see it here and it's, it's just funny, isn't it? It's like, the simple things in life if you're happy with your family and your wife your boyfriend whatever it may be and your kids are running you know like you, your kids run on the field and you give them a hug it's just powerful and and I haven't been back home and I've been offered to come back and work at home and stuff but I think if I ever do I'm going to use my experiences from Hong Kong and here to go that is important, like performance is important and being like really hard on people, but also people are humans and you get the best out of someone and get to know someone and connect is a powerful thing. Um, that's my philosophy and I, I do that with our, every one of our boys. I know where they're from, they got brothers and sisters, do they do long distance relationships? Like I work really hard with our head coach. One of my roles here is to do that is yeah. to understand the boys, how they learn, what, how do I get the best out of them, along with the coaches. So I really pride myself on that. So I agree. Um, it does get overlooked. And I don't, I honestly, at any level, obviously if you're international level, there is a lot of pressure on performance, but I still think it's really important. Yeah. And I just wanted to sort of go back to um, like, the MLR and American rugby and where do you think the potential of we mentioned earlier obviously the players um coming into the MLR next season and that, that have been coming in what do you think the potential of the of the MLR can reach and the potential of American rugby as well I know you've got a few boys at the Guillotinis involved in the national setup obviously really talented players what do you think is the potential there and what do you think needs to happen for um the United States to to sort of push on and become a, a global rugby force? Um, yeah, it's a million dollar question, but there's 300, 320 million people live in the US and I just can't believe it isn't a force, but you can see by their sevens team, you know, like their top four in the world consistently the last couple of years. Um, so they've got, they're starting to get a talent and it's scary how much athletic talent is in the US. Um, MLR is growing year on year, like week to week at the moment, the quality of rugby. Um, I think there needs to be investment in the league. We There needs to be more money for backroom staff and really educating the local players. So obviously I'm passionate about education and analysis and it's something I'll continually drive and I want to be a part of it for the next 10 years. But We spend a lot of time with our boys educating them and understanding and not um, growing their understanding of the game. So I think the league definitely needs more money. I guess USA 
rugby could do with a bit more money to support them. But I, I definitely think the infrastructure and the staff is important. That yeah. doesn't mean you bring everyone in from New Zealand because they're amazing. It's upskilling local people here to do better and understand the game, including the players, and just a bit more cash to support the league. Um, I feel those things will just see huge growth. Um, and we've got four or five boys here who are Aussies, but their parent, one of their parents are American. So picking out those boys from around the world and bringing them here where they are American passport holders. Yeah. And that's only going to make the squad more competitive, which will make the team better. And I, I was just thinking that I know you mentioned um, you how big college sport is in, in America and you went to, you've been to see a few college football games. Do you think maybe um, like putting some more resources into rugby at college level and stuff like that will bring a, a few more talented players through? Yeah, I think um, with the head injury stuff in football, more and more people are starting playing rugby. I haven't got the numbers, but I know in certain states, sport like soccer, baseball, golf, tennis, rugby are growing because they just don't want their kids playing football. So I really do think um, once that, kind of transition it's not going to happen overnight but we're seeing it now um there's more we did a couple of combines and we like we signed a couple of football players um and we've actually released them to go and play for the colorado raptors which are a crossover team so like 90 percent of their players used to be footballers um american footballers or basketball players so it's, it's happening um but like I, I just think the potential is endless, mate, if, if they get it right. Yeah, I saw um, it, it was actually on the rugby network, wasn't it? Alex Corbusiero, who you work with, yeah. um, was doing the, uh, the recruitment for, yeah. the, for the Raptors, which was um, very enjoyable, but also very like, educational as well. You, you could see the sort of um, the physical attributes that these guys that he was um, talking to had. And obviously, if you teach them how to play rugby, they'll be pretty dangerous. Yeah. Mate, I, I honestly see um, I see huge growth here, mate. And I'm really passionate about rugby and people and like just, just seeing this country do better and Canada as well as a whole. Yeah. Um, obviously, I'm Welsh and I want Wales to do well. But um, if I'm going to be here for a long time... Um, it's exciting. Like, there's no better place to be in the world. Like, obviously, other countries, like New Zealand, Australia, Ireland, England, Wales, whatever. But, like, I think everyone's starting to look at the USA and go, this is pretty exciting. You've got yeah. nine years, nine, ten years. That means another nine years of MLR. You know, yeah. like, it's pretty exciting times. Yeah, I saw, saw an article earlier as well linking Gatlin to the to the USA coaching, yeah, uh, which would be a uh, well a different, but he's a, obviously a world class coach, global name, and just could be another really exciting thing for USA. It sort of moves on as well to so my last question: was where do you see your future? Do you, do you think you ever move back home, or do you do you think you'll stay in America, or is it not really crossing your mind at the moment? Um, I think so. I'm what is it now? I've I haven't lived in Wales for five years and I took that leap to leave my job there. And I always come home in the summers for like a month or two and relax and um, see everyone. Um, but I'm just really grateful for the opportunity in Hong Kong and here. And I've just had a great time. Like life, I've dedicated my life to my job. Like it's, it's not all fun. It's not all down the beach, like seven days a week grinding is the truth it's, it's like social media versus reality sometimes yeah. but I love it and I'm passionate about it but I do see my future here like there's been opportunities for me to come back in the last few years but no this zero disrespect to anywhere back in the UK but that's just not I just don't feel that's my path yeah. I feel happy here I love the challenge of something different and I think I've gone down that rabbit hole now you know like there was a job in 
uh, with Samoa come up recently and someone reached out to me and I was like, oh, you know, if I wasn't engaged, I'd, I'd be all over that, you know? And like, yeah. so my mind is more like, I'm not saying Wales wouldn't challenge me, it would, and I'd use as much as I've learned to go there and try and try and do my best. But I like the excitement of the unknown now, so I've gone down that hole. So I don't know where I'm going to go after this, but I'm just enjoying the moment at the moment. 